Welcome to the Money Insights Podcast, where high income earners come to learn wealth building strategies that will take them from high income to high net worth. With your hosts, financial and wealth building experts, Christian Allen and Rod Zabriskie. Welcome into another episode of the Money Insights Podcast, where we talk all things money and business. My name's Christian Allen. I'm here with my co host, who you all know as both. Rodney the Pod Zabriskie and Rod the Pod Zabriskie. <laughs> so, Rod, my fiance mentioned to me that your that your nickname had morphed. It started out with as Rod the Pod, which makes a little bit of sense, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And somehow it moved to Rodney the Pod. Um, but I think we can go either direction. I like them both. Yeah, I'll respond to anything. And uh, but I've noticed that that you like to call me Rodney. Oh, and like I'm not the only Rodney. one. I mean, I'm. Uh, you're one, you're one of the um the few though. I'm it's like I said, it's a term of endearment. So Yeah. Um when I say Rodney the po- I know it doesn't rhyme as well, but like it feels good to me. It feels yeah. good. Yeah. Okay, Rod the Pod or Rodney the Pod. Today, we're going to kind of set the record straight and talk about a subject that we get asked. I, I don't know if I want to say frequently, but we mm-hmm. certainly get asked it here and there, right? And and the question is really what is different between what we do versus infinite banking, Yeah. right? So like I said, today we're going to set the record straight. We're going to get put those pesky infinite bankers on one side of the street, (laughs) and we're going to put the Money Insights team on the other. No, I'm kidding. Um, Infinite banking has a lot of powerful principles, and we use some of those principles to uh, help people build wealth. However, there are some pretty significant differences in the way that we do things. And so we want to make sure that uh, we do our best to kind of set the record straight. Does that sound okay to you? Yeah, that sounds good to me. And and I would say that we have probably even fed the confusion because maybe even on our website. We'll stop or, doing or that, Rod. Yeah, it's done. It's gone. So if you go to okay. our website now, we no longer uh, identify this is, as Yeah, years bankers. ago, like we've, <laughs> we've made a full recovery. We've been down the 12 step path. Uh, is that is it 12 steps? 12 step recovery, yep. Yeah, nope. yeah, yeah. So we've gone through all 12 steps. We're fully recovered from the infinite banking world. Um, and now we're like back on the straight and narrow, wouldn't Sweet. you say? Oh yeah. Yeah, we're okay. we're clear. We're clean. Okay, Rod. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna start by talking about the money insights philosophy and kind of yeah. um contrast that a little bit against what we generally see from the infinite banking crowd. Okay. Perfect. So why don't you kick us off? Okay, so on, like, what what we try to do is, we, in, when, as we're working with people, we want to understand what they're looking for and and then help them get there, right? Mm, Seems pretty straightforward. That is a big difference. Not everything's about the system. Right, right. So we see cash value life insurance as kind of like a Swiss Army knife, right? It can do a lot of things and and be a lot of things to to you know in different circumstances, right? Mm, so yeah. one of the things that that I I think will help. Uh, maybe clear up the confusion is one of the reasons we get lumped in with infinite banking is because of the tool we use. We're using quite often guaranteed maximum overfunded dividend paying whole life insurance. We also use indexed universal life, which okay, and that's a massive the infinite difference. Banker, yeah, the, massive the, difference already. Okay, yep. so like you cannot use anything but whole life insurance in the infinite banking world. And again, to be fair, at one stage in our world, we almost believed that. Mm-hmm. It took some. It took quite a bit of study and research to get us on to understanding where an IUL could work, and particularly yep. in conjunction with, you know, sophisticated premium financing strategies. Yeah. Yep. And so we'll get in here in a minute and specifics about infinite banking and, and specifically what it is. But on the whole, life insurance can be used for, obviously, we use it for, you know, with our investors, we can use it, get conservative leverage and and amplify the kinds of returns and future income and other things that can be created with it. Uh, if, if you go out there, you can find people who are using it specifically for retirement income planning, uh, and that's all they're they're talking about for college planning for uh, you name it like all Estate kinds of planning, different yep, all of those the, different it can be varieties the, it can be the uh, planning yep the bond side of your portfolio right it can it can kind of serve as a lot of people will use it as that purpose 
So again, kind of a Swiss army knife, a lot of different ways that it can be used. And what we want to do are, again, go back to our philosophy is to align the strategy with the individual, not pr come and present a, a system that people just should plug into and, and, uh, and go for it. Yeah. And that's a huge difference, right? So we are laser focused on the specific niche that we want to be allowing the life insurance to help us build. Yep. So like you said, if it's a, if it's a Swiss army knife, we're going to use that Swiss army knife in any given situation specific to the goal of creating wealth inside the strategy that we're putting in place. Now right. we should also say that, that life insurance isn't the only tool to build wealth, right? Right. It's, one of many, many tools to build wealth. And for us, we primarily use it in conjunction with other alternative-based asset classes. We talk mm -hmm. a lot about real estate and, and all of the variations of that. We could go on and so forth. But the point is, is that life insurance, as you said, Rod, is really a tool. It's not the end game, right? We right. want to use it where it can be powerful and effective for us. But guess what? If it's not going to be useful and effective, and help us build wealth in a specific area, then we just don't have any interest in using it. Right. So yep. very big difference. Wealth creation, Rod, like you said, versus interest rate arbitrage system. And the reason I threw that name out there, that, that idea out there is because we're here in a minute, we're going to dive into what that means. What is kind of this interest rate arbitrage system? Okay, Rod. So um, that's, that's kind of the philosophical differences between money insights and infinite banking. Now let's kind of get into the overview of what each of them are. So if someone were to come up to you, Rod, and just say, what is infinite banking? Um, what would you say? Except I'm just realizing something, Rod. Before we do that, I have to throw out all the names because we could go in a very in, in yeah. different directions, right? Infinite banking is called like 17 things, but here are the primary ones. First one is infinite banking, bank on yourself, cash flow banking, family banking, perpetual wealth strategy. Mm -hmm. There's all sorts of kind of names for it. Those are the primary ones that you'll see. Yeah. Is that fair? Yep. And, and I think what happens is, is people will see it go by different names and then we'll, they'll come across the investment optimizer, for example, and they'll say, Oh, that sounds an awful lot like infinite banking. It may, it must just be another, mm. another name for infinite banking. Right. Yep. And so, and while I understand why it gets lumped in and we'll, we'll hit, hit on that. It, to some people may feel like by the time they're done listening to this, oh, it's just kind of a nuanced difference between the two. But I tell you what, over time, I've just come to, to realize that the nuanced differences we're going to talk about result in a very different approach to the strategy. So if, if infinite banking is what you want, then you would approach it in a different way than you will if you're working with us and we're, for example, going uh, to doing the investment optimizer. Right. Yeah. And it's, it's not uncommon for us to have people who come back and say, well, Hey, I was reading X, Y, Z about infinite banking and they suggested this rather than mm -hmm. this. And you guys mm -hmm. are doing this. Yeah. Right. And again, for us, it's not about the system. It's about the person. And we're always going to go back to figuring out how to create as much value as possible for the individual within the strategies that we're teaching that we're, that we're implementing and that's counterintuitive to what the infinite banking crowd is, because it's almost like they believe infinite banking is a perfect system, mm -hmm. right? A money system, an ecosystem that you can use. And, and, and again, like we're going to get into this, but it's not like where we're saying, okay, money that you're going to invest, we're going to add a layer of profitability to it. Mm -hmm. They're saying every dollar that I earn is going to go into my policy and then I'm going to use the system to pay my bills and do all these other things. Now you can use yeah. it, you know, more broadly or more narrowly within that. But generally that's kind of the overview in terms of like what the philosophy is. Yeah. Is that okay. fair? Is that fair? Yep. Okay, Rod. So now that we've kind of defined philosophies and differentiated those a little bit, let's go into this concept that we've talked about that you, that you brought up earlier in the show. And that is interest rate arbitrage. That's yeah. something that I don't think that most people will make sense of automatically. So just help us understand so that we have a reference point. Okay. So really at its core, that's what infinite banking is trying to do is create a difference between interest that you're earning inside of this life insurance policy versus interest that you're paying on your loan. And more specifically, they would say, okay, well, if I'm earning, you know, 
five and a half percent uh, between the guaranteed interest and the dividend inside of my life insurance policy, but I'm paying four and a half, five percent interest on my loan, that by itself creates value. And so if I just take loans for everything I'm doing, the loan in and of itself creates that interest rate arbitrage. And so why wouldn't I, if it works for anything, right? For, for the why buying the car. For everything. Yep. Okay. So Rod, why don't you like using that as like the core system? Yeah. Okay. We're going to get into uh, the, some of the differences here in a bit of, of basically it leads us down a path to where, um, for example, in the infinite banking world, they would say you only want non-direct recognition policies. Mm, okay. Yes. So we there's this difference between direct out. and non-direct. We'll, we'll get into the specifics on what that is. So, but, but that becomes a problem because if, if I'm only willing to look at policies that are non-direct and I eliminate all of the direct recognition policies, then I've actually eliminated the best performing policies out there. Right. Rod, you're still on my thunder on that. I'm oh, excited yeah. to talk about that I don't want to go too point. far, but but that's ultimately what it does is it leads us down paths that we don't want to be down, right? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to do a quick overview. So when we talk about infinite banking, it's really an ecosystem using dividend paying whole life insurance as the kind of your core, right? Yep. So we get in this ecosystem, we use overfunded dividend paying whole life insurance. That's the similarity, right? That's mm -hmm. the similarity between part of what we do. And that's what I say. I keep saying the similarity, but I'm talking about in one strategy. And I think yeah. that's really critical because in, because even the investment optimizer is just a strategy within many strategies that just happens to, it's one that's widespread because people who invest, it just makes sense. Mm -hmm. But, but at the end of the day, that's what it is. It's a strategy not an, an entire ecosystem using overfunded life insurance. And then what we're not focusing in the same way on is this concept of using this interest rate arbitrage. Now we want to use interest rates to our advantage. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But like you said, we're not doing, we're not creating loans and making loans just for the sake of doing it. We're doing it focus specifically to improve the investments. Yeah. And what you said earlier, create wealth, build wealth right? Not just for the sake of the loans. Okay. So I think that's probably a good overview of infinite banking. Now, Rod, let's switch gears and just talk about kind of what we're doing again in the strategy of the investment optimizer. Yeah. So the investment optimizer, we're using overfunded whole life insurance policies, right? So again, okay. it sounds the same, yep. sounds similar still, but. Yep. Uh, but our purpose again is to add another layer of profitability to alternative investing. So we, we build this cash value. We take a loan. We use that loan to go and invest where we create much larger returns than what we're able to get inside of the policy. So that's one of the things is we're not telling people, hey, put your money into life insurance policy because we think it's great that you'll you'll get the 5% return in there. Not that it isn't great. Tax-free return. Yeah. Uh, and and for your, you know, your money that's that's in between deals, like that yes. is a powerful um, enhancement to investments. But again, that's not the only thing. And that's the key is that when when we meet up with people who are investing in real estate, other alternative investments, usually they're flowing all their cash through a, a regular savings account or their money market account, right? And so what what the this whole life policy is to do is to replace that as the opportunity fund from which you do all of your investing and flow all the money through your investments, the cash flow and and all that. So uh, that's the whole point. And, and so therefore, again, going back to our philosophy, it becomes a wealth creation or wealth augmentation, augmentation tool in conjunction with all of the other cool stuff people are doing. Okay. I think that's a good overview. And people who listen to us, we talk about it all the time. So you probably have a good, strong grasp of what we're doing inside the investment optimizer. Kind of does what it says it does. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk about the primary similarities and differences, Rod. And And I'm thinking here, we'll get into like actual like nuanced differences mm -hmm. to kind of help play this out. So from your perspective, um, what are the primary similarities and differences? And maybe just do kind of an overview of the the handful that we've listed out, okay. and then we'll just take them one by one and uh, knock them out. Okay. So the first one is this difference between loans for the sake of loans for, to get that arbitrage versus loans to create value. Okay. So that's number one. 
That's the, okay. the contrasting difference between the two. Second one is interest rate arbitrage versus that's obviously on the investment or in the infinite banking side yep. versus on the investment optimizer side, uh, creating an arbitrage, the difference between paying simple interest on your loans versus earning compounding interest inside of your, your policy. Okay. So we'll get into that. Okay, good. Third one, we hinted at before this difference between direct recognition and non-direct recognition. Fourth, uh, paying more interest versus optimizing cash flow. And then the last one, is this idea of, of a broad money system versus a laser focus of the, the strategy of, of the investment optimizer, which is to create more profitability for the investing. Okay. So Rod, let's start right from the top. Loans for the sake of arbitrage versus loans to create value. What does that mean? Yeah. So this is the idea we talked about a minute ago, where if, if I go get a uh, go, I'm going to go buy a car and instead of just getting a loan from the dealer or from the bank, I'm going to be in my own bank, right? I'm going, going to uh, take a loan against my policy, pay myself the uh, the monthly payments with the interest. And so I'm capturing all of that otherwise interest that I would have paid to the bank. I'm paying it to myself essentially. Okay, Rod, I have to do a little bit of a rant here. Okay. <laughs> because... Um, obviously, we spent some time around the infinite banking crowd, right? right? Mm -hmm. And when I think about these concepts that we're kind of getting into, I can't help but thinking about the the concepts or the ideas that we would teach people. And and they were kind of ridiculous. And we, we've we like, I wouldn't say disagreed, but we've maybe um, not come to the same place in terms of what the point was. Mm -hmm. But inside these conversations we're having with people we're describing to them how they can look and feel and act like the bank, right? Mm -hmm. I just remember this and, and maybe I'm crazy, but all the infinite bankers that I remember told me how cool the banking system is, how cool, well, fractional reserve banking and then our current banking system and how you can go and loan your money out 10 times. And we just need to use the same principles that the bank's using to be super profitable. Mm -hmm. Well, the problem is, Rod, that infinite banking doesn't do that at all. So, <laughs> so that's my rant. If if you hear these like long, long-winded explanations about how fractional reserve banking and Austrian economics work and how we, we need to be on the gold standard, and then we, and then you also want to focus on how to emulate the banking principles that we're seeing today because the banks are the most profitable institutions in the world. That's what I hear when I hear infinite banking. Like mm -hmm. it's just a big mess is my experience. Um, and that's coming from what you might even call a, a former practitioner. Mm -hmm. And so what we did is we really focused on extracting the things that we believed helped people build wealth and create value. Okay. Sorry, Red, that's yeah. my rant. Now, uh, well, that's a good bridge to the other side of that, right? Because okay, if, if the, on the one side, we're saying, you know, loans for the sake of arbitrage may or may not make sense. Loans for the the sake of creating value, adding value to the to the investment pe people mm, are doing. That makes sense. That makes hey, sense. Hey, sorry for the interruption. Just wanted to let you know that you can take the F3 assessment right now over at moneyinsights.net. And after the short five minute assessment, you'll get specific recommendations that will help you move from high income to high net worth. Enjoy the rest of the show. That fits within our philosophy and and the the approach that we have been taking. All right, Rod. So we've talked about loans for the sake of arbitrage. Um, let's mix it up a little bit, but talk about uh, direct recognition versus non-direct, because this is a huge thing in the infinite banking world. It is, yeah. Okay, so let's just clarify what it is first, okay? And then we'll let you kind of give us your thoughts on it. So it's the way that the interest is credited to the cash value of the policy, while I have a loan outstanding, okay? So in the, let's start with non-direct. Uh, I'm earning a guaranteed interest and a dividend on my cash value. Let's say I have 100,000 in there. I take a $60,000 loan. I'm still earning on the full 100,000, the same guaranteed interest and dividend. There's no change. There's no difference in the way I earn my interest in a non-direct recognition situation, okay? Okay, and, and that can be intriguing. Right. Like talk yeah. about why, why that can be intriguing for people. 
Yeah. So let me first explain the direct okay. And, okay. and then I think, I think I uh, understand the difference. So on the direct side, when I take a loan, the interest that I'm earning on the portion of my cash value is acting as collateral against that loan earns interest in a different way than it was before. Okay. So if, I'll use the example again. So hundred thousand dollars in my cash value, I take six, a $60,000 loan. The full hundred thousand is still continuing to grow. But the portion, the 60000 in my cash value that's acting as collateral against that loan, the interest it's earning is directly linked to the interest rate that I'm paying on the loan. Okay? So as that interest rate changes, the interest that I'm earning in my cash value changes as well. Right? Okay. So now getting back to your question, well, why does that... How can that kind of manifest in, in the difference? Well, in the infinite banking world, if the interest rate arbitrage is what I need, then they would point you to always toward non-direct, always, because- Because that's right, the system. Right now I can earn more, I'm earning more in my, in my guaranteed interest rate and dividend than what I'm paying on my loan, okay? Whereas if it's direct recognition, then- I don't, I don't always have that arbitrage. I'm not creating that, that interest rate arbitrage. So, but what's interesting about that is in a rising interest rate environment, what's going to happen is that the guaranteed interest and dividend is going to end up being lower than the loan rate. In other words, a rising interest rate means I pay higher interest on my loan, right? So let's just use numbers. Let's say right now, uh, with with you know one of the companies maybe I'm earning 5.2 percent on my uh, guaranteed interest rate and dividend maybe I'm paying four and a half percent on the loan well as interest rates rise all of a sudden I'm paying five and a half six and a half seven percent on my loan but I'm still earning the 5.2 on the guaranteed interest rate and dividend now eventually higher interest rates will push the dividend higher as well but there's going to be this time frame where I'm now actually flipped it. I'm paying more interest than what I'm earning. I, I now have a negative arbitrage, right? And and I I just don't think that's talked about much in the infinite banking world. I think that's a piece where, uh, especially because interest rates have been so low for the last, you know, 15 years almost, um, it's almost gotten to be to where people just expect that's just always what's going to happen. I'm always going to have that positive arbitrage. And pretty soon there's going to be a kind of a day of reckoning where this rise in interest rates is going to push people to a place where all of a sudden, wow, I'm what's going on here. I'm, I'm now paying more interest than I'm earning in my policy. Okay. Right? But guess what, Rod, there's an even bigger problem with the direct recognition, non-direct recognition issue. Okay. The bigger issue is that by only limiting yourselves to limiting your to policies that are non-direct, mm -hmm. you're eliminating the very best cash building policies that exist. So the question is, is the interest rate arbitrage more important than the building of cash? And what we found by doing a whole bunch of numbers and research and due diligence is that it's far less important that that whether it's direct or non-direct is far less important than how much cash the actual policy is gr growing. So yep. as an example, and, and maybe I'll put this in some context. Let's just say I'm a high income earner. I'm putting $100,000 a year into my policy. And the question I have to ask myself is this, right? Am I willing to get potentially a percent difference in like my the growth of my cash value? And just think about this for a little bit, right? So, So most people don't realize this, but I shouldn't say that. Most people do realize this, but like they, we don't really realize it until we look at the numbers. Mm -hmm. So those numbers become astronomically different the further we go down the policy, right? Mm -hmm. So if we look in the first five years or 10 years, these policies might look pretty similar. But if you're, if you're putting a lot of money into it and you're losing, let's say you're getting 4.1% or 3.8% instead of 4.9 or 5 it's literally the difference in hundreds of thousands. And as you mm -hmm. get further down, it's the difference in millions of dollars. Yeah. So what we found is that there is no possible way to make up for those hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars by using interest rate arbitrage with the focus on non-direct, especially because like you said, Rod, we don't even know that that's going to be 
uh, that that's going to work for us long term, right? right? We know yep. it works today, but again, it works if we're willing to utilize less. I, I don't know what the right word is. It works if we're willing to go with policies that just aren't building the kind of cash that, mm -hmm. that we're able to with our direct recognition companies. Yeah. And, and that gets at the heart of earlier I mentioned... Uh, sometimes these infinite banking principles push us toward a direction and down a hole that just doesn't make sense. And this is probably the perfect example of that, that the infinite bankers would say it, it has to be non-direct. It just has to. Has to be non-direct. Because it doesn't yes. work. You don't get the, the, the same arbitrage on the, on the direct versus the non-direct. Okay, well, let's, you know, let, let's come back to reality. And, <laughs> and like you said, because it, it's, it is a matter of just priority. In other words, we are, we don't care direct non-direct we're, we're not partial to that because we know it's about that, the result it's not the about right the system. policy gets you a much better result than focusing too much and getting bogged down too much in the direct versus non-direct now i will say this rod if if all things were equal let's say i had a policy that was growing every bit as strong as not like i might be more interested and more focused on considering the difference between direct and non-direct mm -hmm. but right now that delta mm -hmm. between policy, the non-direct companies and the comp the companies that are direct and really performing well is mm -hmm. just so significant that it feels extremely short-sighted to focus on that issue. Yeah. And again, anyone that plays the numbers out will realize that it doesn't have much of an impact long-term. Especially because what we can do is in a low interest rate environment like today, we can go out and get a line of credit through a bank oh. and and still create that that interest rate arbitrage. Even, yeah, even with and it's another level of company. it. Yep. So, so yeah, that's a really great point. We didn't even bring that up, but obviously, if we're wanting to be as effective from an interest rate standpoint as possible, the next step is just to get the cash value line of credit. And now mm -hmm. all of a sudden, we're paying three, three and a half, um, which is lower than than the bank or than the life insurance companies are yep. are allowing loans out from. Yep. Okay, Rod, that was good. That was kind of a rant, but I think it was important. So let's talk a little bit about uh, number four here, which is paying more interest versus optimizing cash flow. Okay, good. This gets back to uh, Nelson Nash, and again, I I wouldn't say people wouldn't benefit from from reading you know Nelson Nash or whatever. Uh, I, I would. think there are some good principles. <laughs> okay, but <laughs> I, so... I hate that book, Rod. No offense, Nelson <laughs> but Nash, but that book is a disaster. Uh, anyway. Okay, People so here's gonna the be thing. like feeling like I'm uh what's the word? Not not slander. It might be a little bit slanderous. I don't mean it that way, but like uh do you remember Heretic? I told you the story about when I threw down that very important book yes. onto the ground? Yes. What's the word I'm looking for? You're a heretic. Okay, yeah, that's 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 <laughs> it. They're gonna be like, this guy has completely gone apostate against all infinite banking principles, which yeah. of course isn't true. We love, love, love cash value life insurance. I just don't really love infinite bank. It and it's the direction it takes it again. Just just some of the the kind of rabbit holes you end up in. And so this is this is one of them. Um, with okay, so let's go back to the car, the car loan example, right? Okay. The, the infinite banking purists would say that when you take that loan and you're going to to pay it back to yourself now, right, instead of the bank, that you should pay yourself the same interest rate as what you were what you would have paid the bank. Okay. Even mm -hmm. though, even though you could pay yourself lower, right? If the interest rate that you're being charged on it is, is that the four or 5% or, or if you mm -hmm. have the cash value line of credit, the, you know, three and a half percent, if the bank was going to charge you six, you should pay six. Okay. Or more, if you can afford more. more, if you can pay, pay more. more, it's even better. Yep. Yep. And the difference between that and what we're doing is it's all about the cash flow. Right. In other words, if I took the loan to go out and invest in a piece of real estate and that real estate is kicking off a certain cash flow, I'm going to flow all of that back into my policy, regardless of trying to measure interest rates and pay myself more or all these things. I want to optimize the cash flow, the, the money that's ultimately going to end up going into future investments and just get it back into the, the policy as quickly as I can. Right. So it's more about optimizing cash flow than it is about measuring interest rates and and paying myself more interest or you know those kinds of things that again a nuanced difference 
but can have really significant uh, difference in just the system, like the the way that I'm flowing it in and out of these investments. Okay, Rod, did we talk about number? Did we talk about number one, two, three, and four? Are we on five? We you were excited to get to three, so we missed number. So two. I jumped. Well, yeah, I was trying to I was trying to break us up a little bit. Let's go back <laughs> to the interest rate arbitrage, which you started to get into a little bit yeah. above, but maybe. Mm-hmm. Finish your thoughts on interest rate arbitrage versus arbitrage created by paying simple interest and earning compound. Okay, so now that we've really delineated the difference between direct versus non-direct, I think this is a good direction to go. Uh, Because we're not, in the investment optimizer, we're not worried about that interest rate arbitrage, right? In other words, earning earning This sounds blasphemous, Rod. Are you sure we're not... Were you sure we're not worried about the interest rate arbitrage? Are we happy about earning five and paying three and a half? Yes. Yeah, we're happy. We love that. Okay. Okay. We love it. It is positive. Okay. However, Sorry, I didn't mean to break break in there. The difference is that's not the play, right? The play is more about, about the cash flow, right? So we're taking the loan, invest it, use that cash flow to flow it back in. And when we do that, we end up paying simple interest on the loan side while earning compounding interest inside of our policy. And in that way, all of a sudden the interest rate, the specific rates don't matter as much because even if I'm paying a little higher rate on the loan than what I'm earning inside of my cash value, I'm still going to overcome that with the, the difference between simple and compound. Right? So that again, it, it keeps us from going down a rabbit hole of that interest rate arbitrage, what happens when interest rates are rising versus falling versus direct versus non-direct, all these different things aren't as important. I think that's well stated. So, so Rod, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do a quick overview of our similarities and differences, and then I'm going to lay out the fifth one and we're going to wrap this thing up. Okay. So, The first one in our similarities and differences was loans for the sake of arbitrage versus loans to create value. Second, interest rate arbitrage versus arbitrage created by paying simple interest and earning compound. Rod just went into that. We talked about direct versus non-direct and our focus really not being on either of them, but on building cash through the most effective cash building policy we can find. Mm-hmm. Uh, the fourth one was about paying more interest versus optimizing cash flow. And we're going to talk about number five, which is, in my opinion, what makes us so much different than the infinite banking crowd. And that's this. We are laser focused on strategies that will build wealth across yeah. the board. So we talk about that in the premium finance space. We talk about it in the alternative investment space. Obviously, the investment optimizer is really just a tool for us to add the layer of profitability to investments. But at the core of it, we're not interested in following a money system. We're interested in helping people specifically high income earners build wealth in innovative and effective ways. Yeah, I think that's well said. Okay, Rodney, uh, we made it through it. Is there anything else you want to hit on before we take off? No, I think we've done it. Okay. That's, It's been fun. Thanks everybody for joining us for today's episode of the Money Insights Podcast and we will see you next week. Thank you for listening to the Money Insights Podcast. To learn more about the financial and business strategies discussed in this show, please visit moneyinsights.net. The views and opinions expressed on the Money Insights Podcast are not intended to be individual financial, tax, or legal advice. Always consult with the appropriate advisor before making financial decisions. And if you're enjoying the show, please feel free to rate, subscribe, and leave a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. This will help others find the show and learn wealth building strategies for themselves. Thanks again for tuning in, and we'll catch you in the next episode.